The Lord's Prayer is something we all know. We've all said it many times. But what does it really mean for us? What is Jesus teaching his disciples through this prayer? Well, today I'm going to try to help us understand that a little bit more by unpacking Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. I hope you'll enjoy this message, and I look forward to seeing you here at First Presbyterian Church. God bless. I get to preach now. Right. Okay. Here we are. So I'm preaching now. Great. Great. Uh, let's see. Does this thing tip a little bit? Thank you. Ah, oh, this is great. Well, when, let's give a little round of applause what we've seen so far. How great is that? I've already seen something I'd like to incorporate into my sermons. I need a pop-up God behind me for key moments. <laughs> I think that would be really, bam, all of a sudden. I just love that. He just appeared out of nowhere. That was wonderful. Well, what a cool thing. What a great thing to see our kids. And, and it just feels kind of like you, you have with kids. You can't imagine all the intense whispering that's happening in the front two rows. You go. No, you. You're dead. You know, like, so <clears throat> that's what you're missing in the back. But we're, I hope you're enjoying it. Well, this Sunday, not only is this wonderful Sunday for kids and, I, and so great. By the way, not only are the, the kids up here, but also the kids' families are up here. Here's a little secret you may not know about these kids' families. They typically come in and they go in the back and they kind of arrive just about the time. You know, all these kids emerge and think, where are these kids coming from? They emerge with the families. They kind of arrive just about the time the children's message. Down they come. So it's great to have you guys up front. You see in my house every other week. It's great to have you here. Uh, last Sunday, I was preaching on the story that was just previous to this. That is the story of Mary and Martha. And you, are my, you might recall my nearly sacrilegious charge that I made for we get her done Presbyterians, and that was, I want you to get less done. I came in the next day, Monday, into the office, and uh, we had a staff meeting, and one of the p- persons in the staff said, well, I'm not going to do much this week because my boss told me to get less done. So that didn't work out quite as well. But I hope that you have allowed yourself this week to be a little bit more Mary, a little bit less Martha. I hope you had occasion to stop and thank God in the middle of the day for all that he had given you and just reflect a little bit more upon the Lord. Well, the disciples all seem to have learned something from Jesus lifting up this example of Mary because today they approach Jesus with this same kind of openness, this childlike behavior that that is ready to receive whatever Jesus has. And so today we're looking at the Lord's Prayer as Luke has it. We read these words. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. May we pray together. Lord, as we gather as your people, old and young and everything in between, we ask for your wisdom, for your teaching, for your spirit to guide us as we consider your word. And now, Lord, hear us as we pray together the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. They must have noticed, the disciples must have noticed as As Jesus goes away, it says he goes off to pray in a certain place. We know from the Gospel of Mark that he would go out what was called there a solitary place to pray before dawn. He also went off by himself in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil and he prayed 
there in the wilderness for 40 days. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, even where you would expect them to huddle up and be together, that's a place where he goes off. He takes some disciples with him, but he sort of drops them off and goes further off to be by himself and to pray. So now, once again, in our passage, it says that he was praying in a certain place. In other words, he had gone off to pray. And the disciples, they want to know more about what this moment means to Jesus. They also know that John taught his followers to pray. And so the question is, what is our prayer signature? How should we pray? So they ask Jesus to teach them. And we should stop there and just consider what a remarkable request that was. Because they were raised in the tradition that ate, slept, and drank prayer. They prayed the Kadesh every morning, every noon, every night. Their scripture was filled with the prayers of David. Solomon's prayer as he opened the temple is forever immortalized in the Bible. The prophets pray for help. Daniel prays before Nebuchadnezzar. There was a tradition that understood prayer. And these disciples... They were men of prayer. I mean, they had to be those who had prayed, Lord, is this really the right thing for me to leave my business, to leave my life and follow after Jesus? It says that they they rejoiced when they came back from those two missionary trips where they, they saw God work. They lifted their hands in prayer. They saw Jesus do amazing things when 5,000 people are fed with two fish and five loaves and People are healed of diseases. So they knew something about prayer, but the example of Mary stuck with them. She had come to learn to simply sit at Jesus' feet. And now it was time for them to do do the same. Perhaps they discussed it among themselves. They probably could have listed a dozen truths they knew about prayer that they had learned at their parents' knee, but Jesus was reforming them. So they are open to the Lord as he returns. Instead of being set in their ways, they are willing to learn. They ask without guile, without any ulterior motives, as so often happened to Jesus. They just request with open hearts, Lord, teach us to pray. I'll bet prayer has been a big part of your life. How long have you been praying? I mean, maybe ever since you could talk, some of these children have been praying, I'm sure. Or perhaps you had that foxhole incident where you were just terrified or there was this illness or this accident and prayer just came bubbling out of you. You know how to pray. You know the phrases that you say, the words that make sense to you. And I just wonder if you would be willing to bring this this basic element of your most private faith life before the Lord. I remember hearing from Jack Hayford He's a, he was often, he, I think he still is on TV, I don't know. He's a pastor from California who spoke to the promise keepers for pastors. And he had some little prayer closet, he told us, that he would go into. I guess it was somewhere in his great big church. And he's in this room, and he is praying, and he has a sense that the Holy Spirit was prompting him to do something unusual. He sensed the Lord was saying, would you dance for me? Now, you might, if you've seen Jack Hayford, you know, he doesn't look like the type who could cut a rug very well. He's a big, tall guy. He has this big old nose that he told us got broken a couple of times. He was a gangly teenager. He never felt any kind of comfort with his body. He wasn't a dancer. He didn't do anything like that. But he heard this quiet word, would you dance? He said he knew that David danced naked before the altar, which I do not recommend to you today. He knew that he was a bit uptight and the point was that he needed to trust God more. And my point is sometimes in all our learning, in all of our habits, in all our tradition, sometimes we need to come back to the Lord to learn the most basic and simple things even if we think we know them already. It doesn't hurt any of us to read, say, mere Christianity again. It isn't a weakness to go back to the basics. And for these men, they wanted Jesus to have sway and control even in their most private hearts. Lord, the disciples said, teach us to pray. 
So Jesus says, all right, try this. And we know these words. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now right now, and I say those words, they sound very familiar to us. Here's my question. Were they familiar to the disciples? The answer is yes. I already mentioned the Kadesh. They prayed it three times. It begins this way. May his great name be exalted and sanctified and may God's name be great. And they say amen and then it goes on. In a world which he created according to his will, may he establish his kingdom. The words are a little different, but it's really the same thing. May his name be honored and may his kingdom come. But there is one radical difference between Jesus' prayer and the Kaddish. The disciples would have heard it immediately. It is those first two words of the Lord's Prayer, which are our Father. In Luke 10, we read, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And now the son is revealing him not simply as his own father, but also as all of our father. And it signals a different approach to faith. It means that God is not some formal other, that God is in fact close, that he is a loving father. He is Abba. You know that in old, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer is really one of the last places where we use old English, where we say, thy, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. It reminds me of the King James Bible and the formal way people spoke of God. Except when I did some reflection, did some study on this, it turns turns out that Old English has a formal and an an informal way of saying you. So like in French, it's tu and vous. If you met the king, then you would would use the formal form. But if you were speaking to your family, if you were speaking to those that you love, you would use the informal form. And in Old English, the informal form was thee and thine and thou. The formal was you and your. So when Jesus prays, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, it actually meant, Daddy, my heavenly Father, I want your precious name to be protected and honored because you are close to my heart. So the first thing Jesus is teaching here with his first two words is this. Can you see the Lord as your parent? Can you embrace him as a father? Can you begin with the idea that he truly cares about you? We'll talk about more, this more next week, but that is our starting point. The next thing I have to lift up is what we ask for. Give us this day our daily bread. We all remember Oprah's wonderful giveaway shows. They were pretty spectacular. People would give her piles of her favorite things. I think all of us remember that scene of largesse when every person in the audience got a car. As a matter of fact, today, every person, no, that's not gonna happen. In fact, I love Jay Leno's follow-up to that. I don't know if you saw that that night where he said, you know, I I love what she did, and so I want to do the same thing. So if you reach under your seat, he said, you'll see a picture of one of my many cars that I'm giving to you. But we always see these spectacles of people living in ridiculous homes and having unlimited resources constantly. And, And I don't think people have changed that much. I mean, the disciples wouldn't have minded having some extra things, some more income, and all the other comforts. But Jesus says, I know you turn to God and you pray for things, so let me show you the size of the ask that you might have for him. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread became the cry of the children of Israel who were caught between Egypt and the promised land there in that desert. And they kept complaining to Moses that he had left, led them out in the wilderness to die. And so God says, Mo, don't worry, I've got this. And he brings down manna from, he- from heaven. Except how long would the manna last? One day. It was daily bread. And why was that? So that they knew every day they were dependent upon him. And when a few enterprising ones gathered a couple of days worth of bread, that bread would spoil on the second day. It just stank. 
It was the Lord's way of saying, trust me. And already they've seen Jesus feed 5,000 with almost no resources. He has sent the disciples out twice with no food and they were well taken care of. So when we pray, he says, don't ask for, the, for food to make the pantry full. Don't ask for the garage freezer to be packed. Don't ask for the finest car or the greatest 401k. Don't ask that the Lord would give you everything. Ask for today, not forever. Practice asking just for what you need, your daily bread, because part of what we need is to live out trust. And as for everything else, practice gratitude for what you have. Don't be greedy. Be grateful. So right off, there are two things that have stood out. God is our loving father, not some distant figure. And he is telling us to live in radical dependence upon him every day. And then thirdly, there is this great unprecedented line in the prayer of our Lord. It's a line we stumble over in mixed Christian company. We just did it as, as we set it together. Forgive us our debts, but some people go trespasses, and some people say sins. In fact, when I was raised, I was raised in the Episcopalian church my first couple of years, they trespassed there, and I'd see signs that said, no trespassing. I thought that's what we were praying about. And then most of my life, I was a debtor, and then in California, they said sins. So when I lead the Lord's Prayer in second service, my brain just comes to a stop at that line over and over it's a tough life for me. I somehow get through. <laughs> but however you say it, it's a pretty radical idea. I mean, this is what it translates to. Lord, forgive me as much as I forgive others. I mean, who prays that outside of the Lord's Prayer? Nobody. He isn't saying God will only forgive you as much as you forgive others. Jesus is saying, don't let your prayer be walled off from your life. Let your prayer inform your life. Let your prayer change your life. You say God is your father, then that means your life needs to bear some family resemblance. You are part of God's family. He is your father. That means you need to do what he does. So when we confess, when we say, Lord, I blew it, we need to remember that same forgiveness we receive is owed to others. I was so righteous about my child getting her homework done and I wanted to make sure she got it done. And then I went into the office and I made that presentation that I really hadn't worked on at all. We give money to a poor person and they don't seem grateful. Well, just before we get an attitude, how grateful are we for what God has given to us who are able to live out the promise that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive? The third point in our prayer needs to not only bring us before God in that moment, but take us back to our world as people who show God's character to others. So let's review and let's apply. Is your prayer life changing you to be more forgiving to others because you realize how much the Lord has forgiven you? If you don't think you have much to forgive, you better rethink that prayer life of yours. He teaches us to say, forgive us our debts. In other words, we're not perfect. Let's not expect others to be either. Is your prayer focused more on the basics than on the frills? You're at, if you are asking a God for a new car and he gives you a, a tune-up instead on your old one, you need to still get an attitude of gratitude for what God has given you. Be thankful for the daily bread. And then what about letting your prayer with God be just a little bit more personal? What about seeing him as someone who truly loves you? I told you that about Jack Hayford and how he was challenged to dance before the Lord. And, you know, this, this uh, conference for pastors just packed. It was in the Georgia Dome, filled up with pastors. And he said he got his 6'2 frame up in that, whatever that prayer closet was, and he started doing something like this. And he said, I'll dance for you, Lord. If that's what you want me to do, I'll dance for you. And it seems a little weird when you look at it from the outside, but all these pastors stood up and started clapping and excited because we understand something of what he was going through. Sometimes you have to be just like a little child before God and believe that he is not expecting you to act in the way you've always done it. Sometimes in prayer, you have to dance. 
He ends with these daunting words, lead us not into temptation. You know, the old joke, don't lead me not into temptation. I can find it myself. But temptation is not necessarily some strange and distant or dark place that you never go to. Temptation, when Jesus faced temptation, the devil took his natural inclinations, like a desire to eat when he was very hungry, and said, let me be the one to satisfy you by doing what I say. And each time Jesus resisted temptation, he did so by relying on the word of God. That's our answer when we face temptation. So may the Lord keep temptation far from us. And when it comes, may we face it with God's word. May our prayer life make us people who are less focused on gaining things and more dependent upon God. And people who show loving forgiveness toward others. And may God continue to teach us to pray. And so I, I believe uh, some young person is going to do the prayer at this point. I'll pray. I am the young person. Thank you, Lord, for that. That's great. A gift of grace given to me. Let us pray. And so, Lord, as we celebrate the young people in this church, and we thank you for the work of those who have, who have poured hours and time into this and the wonderful families that, that have cocooned them, we thank you for a ministry that embraces all ages, all types, who cares for others with this wonderful love that has been spoken to us. And so as we give of our resources, Lord, would you be honored, would you be glorified in the giving that this money might be used for your purposes. We pray it in Jesus' name.